last few weeks, uh, we've been in this series called Organic, and we've been uh, taking a lot of the, the premise for this series from the parable of the sower, and we're going to be looking at that again today. And last week, um, uh, uh, last week we, we didn't look specifically at the parable of the sower because it was Mother's Day, and I wanted to talk about something different. But in week one, um, we, we looked at the parable of the sower, and we looked at Matthew chapter 13, all of that, and it's really good. But um, So we're in this series called Organic. And uh, like a lot of times we, we've done with the word organic, we've kind of misused it and it just kind of means like if we say something happened organically, it just kind of happens naturally or whatever. But in, in all honesty, organic means it, it has great intention. And there were a lot of things that went into it purposefully and a lot of things that we said no to to keep it organic. And, and we oftentimes do that with our relationship with the Lord. Uh, and so we wanted to do this series because it felt like there was a lot of great spiritual, uh, spiritual parallels between what it means to be organic and, or to raise something that's organic and, and what it means to have a, an intentional relationship with Jesus. And um, so uh, I recently was in a situation where uh, I began to think about what I wanted to, my life to look like towards the end. I wasn't in a life or death situation, but it was a pretty, pretty uh, traumatic, or, or maybe dramatic is a better word. It was a pretty dramatic situation. And, and I came to a point where I, I began to think about what the end of my life might look like. Anybody ever been in that situation? Maybe you're in a car accident or, or somebody close to you passes away and you begin to think about what, what is the end of my life going to look like? What, what do I want to leave behind? Uh, who, who, who do I want to leave behind? You know, what, what types of things? What I, and, we, and we can always think about some of the practical things. I, I, I want to make sure that my wife is well taken care of, my kids, college is paid for, or, you know, they're well taken care of, or my grandkids are well taken care of, or, or that my house is, you know, is paid off, or, or that, you know, I don't, I don't want to leave anybody any debt or any, any bills or anything like that. I want to, and I, I came to this point, or I came to this realization, or this, this situation where it became came so overwhelming for me that, that, that it, <clears throat> when I was thinking about the end, that you, the, the, the thing that stood out to me the most was that I, I wanted my kids to serve Jesus. Like, and I, I remember it, it, was, it was several months ago and I was talking on the phone with a good pastor, a friend of mine, and I, I began to break down into tears and, and I begin to tell him, I, I just, like, however all of this ends, whatever comes of any of this, at the end of my life, I just want my kids to love Jesus and be passionate about Jesus. Just want my kids to serve Jesus. That, that's what I want the most. And sure, there are lots of other things. I, I want to I build a church that influences a community and, and changes a city all the way down to the core and the DNA of, of what our city is. And, and I, I want my wife to remember me fondly. And I want to have lots of great friends. And, and I want to have all of these things. But when it really came down to it, what, I, what, I, what stood out to me the most and what I was passionate about the most was I just came. I said, I, I just want my kids to serve Jesus. That's what I want out of life. I want to finish well. I want to finish strong. Maybe you're here and you're a teenager and you're saying, you're looking at the rest of your life and you've determined how you want it to play out. You want to you have this job and you want to have this spouse and you want to have this many kids and a couple of dogs and, and you want to do this and you want to do that and you want to make this much money and all those things are good and great. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. None of those things are eternal though. Maybe you're a little bit older, you're single, and you're, you know, I, I want to have this spouse, I want to have this, I, I, I want to be, influence this career field, or, or this, uh, I want to influence this type of culture uh, with art, or, or with, with music, or with, with something that you do, or what, maybe you're an adult, and you, you've come to the position a little bit more like me, where you, you kind of, I, I want to have a legacy of great kids that marry great people, that and have great grandkids, and great great grandkids, and, and all of that, maybe you're a little bit older this morning, 
and, and, and there's nobody here old. Old is 10 years older than you. So what, wherever you're at, then there's, so you're safe. But if maybe you're older this morning and, you, and you're going, ah, I, you understand exactly where I'm at, what I'm talking about. And here, here's what I've learned in life. Here's what I've learned. We'll put this on the screen. And that's this, that how you start is less important than how you finish. How you start is less important than how you finish. Now, I'm not saying how you start is unimportant or, or, or irrelevant or you shouldn't ever, when you go to start something, you shouldn't start well. But ultimately, at the end of it, how you start is less important than how you finish. With anything in life, uh, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're in a race, you're watching the Olympics, maybe you're watching swimming, and, and it doesn't matter, everybody, it doesn't matter what your start is, what's most important is how you finish. And sure, if you have a good start, it'll help you finish well and finish strong, but it's not most important how you start, it's most important how you finish. And we all, what I've noticed in life is a lot of times we all want credit for how we start. We all want, look how well I started doing this. Look how uh, I've been going to the gym for three weeks now. Look how well I've started. We all want credit for how we start. But would you credit an airline pilot for his takeoff (laughs) before his landing? We don't just credit an airline pilots for their takeoffs, right? Would you fly on an airline that advertised that we have a 100% takeoff rate glad. I want to know your landing rate. How are you finishing? I'm glad you're starting well. How are you finishing? How you start is less important than how you finish. Paul talks about this. At the very end of his life, he's writing He's writing, a, he's writing a letter to uh, his kind of protege or one of his sons in the faith, Timothy. And, and this is what Paul says about the end of his life. This is what he says. He says, I'm ready. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Now, that, that's an Old Testament reference. And, and what he's saying, listen, just, just as much as they would pour out the drink offerings in the Old Testament to honor the Lord, it's saying, look, my life has already have been poured out like it's coming to the very end. It, it doesn't take very long to pour out some liquid onto the ground. He's saying, look, uh, I've already begun the process. My life is coming to an end. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time when I will leave is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Listen, he's talking about the end, not the beginning. Now, there is a crown waiting for me. It is given to those who are right with God, the Lord who judges fairly will give it to me on the day he returns and he will not give it only to me, but he will also give it to those who are longing for him to return. Paul says, listen, my time's coming. I'm going to finish well. Look, I'm finishing well. I shared this story, I think last year, you remember Billy Graham, Dr. Billy Graham passed away recently. I had some friends, or I know of a couple of pastors who visited him about a year before his death. And, and they got the opportunity to, to, to hang out and, and come and see him. And so uh, while they were leaving, uh, they were, of course, they were talking about church and what God's doing in their lives. And, and, and you know, they were sharing with Dr. Graham about all of these things. And, and so they, they came to the point where, where they said to Dr. Graham, it's time for us to go, but will you pray for us? And he said, I'll only pray for you if you'll pray for me. And so Dr. Graham prays for them. They said, what do you want us to pray with you about? He says, pray that I finish Pray that I finish well. That's what Dr. Graham said. He was was at the end of his life, but he was concerned with, how how do I finish? How does this play out? Pray that I finish well. Because how you start is less important than how you finish. 
And Dr. Graham, a man who has won literally millions of people, led millions of people to Jesus, said, help me pray that I finish well. And in week one of this series, we looked at some of the internal problems on the inside of us that, that choke out the seed of growth. But today, I want to look at some of the external things that are outside of us that choke out the harvest and that pre pre prevent us from finishing well. So here's the parable of the sower like we've read in Matthew chapter 13. And just for your own reference, it's also in Luke, uh, Mark 4 and in Luke 8. And, and so we're going to read it in, in Matthew chapter 13 way, the way we've been reading it over the, over the series. And uh, this is Jesus speaking. He's speaking to a great crowd of people. And this is what he is. Then he told them many things in parables saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It, spr it sprung up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants uh, were scorched and, and they withered because they had no roots. Other seeds fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plant. Still other seeds fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. So Jesus is telling this parable, and then he begins to pull his disciples aside, pulls his disciples aside later on, and they ask him about the parable, and he explains why he talks in parables and all of this, and, and then he gives, begins to give explanation for the parable. And so in, in, uh, on the next slide, Matthew, or verse 7, this is where we're going to be looking at today. He said, other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. So here's his, here's his explanation. We're going to jump over to Mark 4 for the explanation. Here it is. So Jesus is explaining the parable after he's, after he's talked about it to the masses. Now he's explaining it to the disciples. And he says, this is what he's talking about. Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceit, deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come and choke the word making it unfruitful. Jesus says, so the word of God is, goes forth. And for some people, it doesn't even break the surface of their heart. And for some people, it gets planted in their heart. It begins to grow up. And, and, but because of the different things going on on the inside of them and offense and different things like that, the, the, there's rocks in their soil. So, so this, the seed isn't very productive. It doesn't grow. And, and then for this group of people, he said, then, then the things around them are, are actually what's contributing. It's not what's going on in them. Or, or there's no problem with the seed because the word of God doesn't return void. There's nothing wrong there there, and, and, but it's the things around them, and here's, here's what I'm learning, is that I have to be careful to judge before, when I'm judging other people's fruit, before I understand their thorns. I need to be careful about the way that I judge other people's fruit without understanding first their storm, their thorns. And, and this is why you should never compare yourself to others. And it might be easy for you, you're here this morning, and go, look at this person's life and how great they are. And look at this person's life, how great, how wealthy, how successful, how much God speaks to them, how much God's used them. And you don't understand the thorns that have gone on around them. And you don't understand maybe the thorns, some of the thorns in your own life. Let me encourage you with this. Celebrate the fruit in your own life. Don't compare it to other people's fruit. You didn't have their thorns, and they don't have your thorns. Sometimes I have to remind myself that, you know what, that person who's super successful or super, you know, God is always, they didn't grow up with my thorns. 
They didn't grow up in the surroundings that I grew up in. And maybe it seems like a small harvest to other people, but you have to understand, you know, you have to understand maybe for you there was an adoption or there was a divorce or there was a death of parents or death of a child or, or there was a bankruptcy or there was a moment where you, you lost everything or somebody took advantage of you. Don't compare your harvest to others. What the enemy intended to choke you out could have ended you, but it didn't. You didn't let it. And what I love about Mark's recollection of this day when Jesus is teaching in Mark 4, he talks about three things that want to choke out the word of God in our life. And I want to look at these. And so here, here's what Mark says in Mark 4. Jesus is saying, he's, Mark is writing, Jesus is saying, still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, he says, the worries of this life. So three things that choke out the word of God. Here's the first one, the worries of life. The worries of life. And for some of us here, the worries of life have been choking out the word of God. They've been choking out the call of God. They've been choking out your destiny. They've been choking out that everything else that God has for you, the worries of this life. And, and maybe for you, it's you watch 24-hour news stations all day, every day, and all you hear is bad news. All you take on is bad news. The economy, terrorism, school shootings, everything that's going on in this world, you're carrying the worries of life, and it's become such a thing in your life that it's begun to choke out the word of God spoken to you or over you for your life. And you've allowed those things around you to influence you more than the word of God. Maybe for, for others, it's, it's the opinion of others, what everybody else is thinking, what everybody else is doing. You're worried about what other people may think of you and you know, you're all over Facebook or Insta or, or Twitter or whatever, and you're constantly worried about the opinions in the, of others and how it looks or how you look or what they'll think about you or what they'll say to you, and, and it's the worries of life are constantly. And here's what you have to understand this morning is that you were never designed to carry the worries of life. You're not designed for that. Jesus said, cast your cares, or I love one translation, says your anxieties on me. Cast them on me. If you can't fix it, you shouldn't be allowed to worry about it. Worries. We're so worried. We're so worried. And for some of you, you can't figure out how come I can't sleep at night or why do I have anxiety or depression or, or why am I dealing with so much fear? Why is there so much chaos in my house, in my home, in my family, at my job? Why is it all everywhere that I go? It seems like it's just constantly out of order. And here's why. is because you've allowed the worries of this world or the worries of this life to influence you more than you've allowed the word of God to influence you. And it's begun to choke it out. It's choking it out. Something that you're carrying that you were never meant to carry. It's choking it out. It continues in verse 19. Here's what Mark says. Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life and... The deceitfulness of wealth. <laughs> Mark's having a get real moment right here. So here's the second thing. Second thing is the deceitfulness of wealth. Mark's having a let's get let's have a real talk. Listen, daddy's home. <laughs> it's time to have a real conversation. The deceitfulness of wealth. In other words, uh, I think one translation that refers to it as ungodly riches. Ungodly, ungodly riches. And, he, and here's what you have to understand, that God is not against wealth. God is not against wealth. I know that there are a lot of people who think that there is a cap on what people should make or whatever. God, God doesn't have that. And, uh, he doesn't believe that. He doesn't think that way. In fact, And here's how I know, because God is incredibly wealthy. 
and he can't be against himself. <laughs> he owns it all. He's the most wealthy. And he's not anti him. There's no contradictions. In fact, Scripture tells us that it's God who gives us the ability to gain wealth. And I'm not trying to sound like, if you're a believer, everybody should be rich. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell prosperity gospel here this morning or anything like that. But God gives us the power to gain wealth. But Mark says, listen, riches can be deceiving. Jesus is telling us, Mark's recording, that, that the deceitfulness of wealth, the deceitfulness, when you think that you, get, you, become, in, in a, you become so secure in who you are or in, your, you know, in, in what you've acquired that you, re, that you stop realizing how much you need Jesus, how much you need God. And listen, for, for a lot of us, that number, whatever that number is, that where we come to a point where we go, you know what, we're doing, we're okay, we can make it, whatever, that's num- that number could be vastly different for a lot of us. Some of us today could be at that number. And you've been tempted with this thought of, you know what, I have everything that I need. And we forget that we need Jesus. We forget that we need God. We forget that he owns it all. And and what this this deceitfulness or the deceitfulness of wealth is this false sense of security that comes from riches or having riches or possessing riches. And if the point was to get wealthy, then you just end up stop doing what you did to get there. In Scripture, Malachi, I think it's the, it's the last chapter of Malachi, but I think it's chapter 4. Hey, Jesus, God, the, excuse me, the, the Old Testament prophet is writing about how to, Malachi is all about how to get your life back in order. And throughout the different chapters of, of Malachi, he's, he's, he's prophesying or talking over to the, Israel, the Israelite people. And he's talking about how to get your home in order, how to get your family in order, how to get, you know, how to restore order in every area of your life. And in the last chapter, he talks about in your finances. He says you want, you want to acquire wealth. Malachi tells you how to acquire wealth. And the problem is the point, if the point of acquiring wealth was to just to get wealthy, then when we get wealthy, we would stop doing what we did to get wealthy. And Jesus, God says, in the kingdom, the principle is, if you want to be blessed or get wealthy, then how do you do that? You give. For a lot of us, we come to a point where we stop giving. We stop being charitable. And here's, here's what you have to understand. That this deceit, when it comes to the deceitfulness of wealth, it doesn't start in people who are wealthy. Poor, poor understanding or poor thinking about finances in, in relationship to the word of God and, and, the, and the, the kind of the principles in God's word about finances, they, they don't start with when somebody becomes wealthy. They start oftentimes much earlier in life when somebody's not wealthy, before they're wealthy. And it just carried in. We think the only people that, that mistreat or misuse their finances are wealthy people. But if you take those patterns all the way back, you'll find the misuse all the way back You'll find the bad mindsets all the way back. The deceitfulness of wealth is, looks a lot like this. I need this, then I'll be happy. If I could just get a bigger home or, or a newer car, or if I, could just, uh, if I could just afford this, or just uh, if I could upgrade this, or if we could just get a pool, or if we could just get a, a second home, or if we could just get a third home, or if we could just get a third car, or if we could just, you know, pay off all of the kids' college and all of the university, and, and maybe their master's degrees as well, if we could just get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, then everything will be okay, then we'll be happy, then it'll all be good. And we associate joy with stuff. We associate joy with financial accomplishments. Here's what we have to understand, that that what you own does not define who you are. What you own 
or the lack of it, either on either side. How much you own or how little you own does not define who you are. The deceitfulness of wealth is that wealth promises more than it can deliver. It can promise more. It always promises more than it can deliver. And here's the problem. Someday, if you're ever blessed enough to acquire great amounts of wealth, you'll still be you. You'll just have more stuff. And the best advice, I'm going to have to edit it. The best advice I ever got from a pastor mentor of mine. He said, if it smells like poo everywhere you go, you should eventually you should check your own shoes. That's the nice version. And that's the problem when we cut stuff is that we think stuff is going to solve our problems and we're, now we're just wealthy with all the same problems. And wealth is always a moving target. <laughs> you know what? how we define rich? is somebody with more than us. Somebody with more than us, that's rich. And the more that we get, there's always somebody with more than us. And so rich becomes this moving thing. So we think once we get here, but then there's always somebody here. And as we move, there's, there's always people who are better off than we are or, or have more cash flow than we do. There's always, there's all of these things. Those undeceived by riches... are not charitable to get more stuff. They are charitable so their stuff doesn't ever get them. And this is important. See, maybe at some point in our life we go, you know what, I, I, I gotta pay my tithes so I can be blessed. I gotta pay my tithes because I, I trust God as my provider. I have to pay my tithes, I have to give, I have to be charitable because I, I, I need God's blessing in my life because you know I don't make a lot of money. My wife doesn't a lot of, make a lot of money. We have all these kids and, 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 and just to make it through the week we, on paper, there's just not gonna be enough. So I, I, I tithe because I, I have to put my finances in the hands of God because in and of myself, I'm not making enough, but God has to provide for me so there'll always be enough. But eventually you come to a point where, where, where maybe you accumulate some stuff and you do have some stuff. You have some wealth. And you need to keep tithing and keeping generous. Why? Not so God will provide because you don't have enough, but now you need to provide so your stuff doesn't own you. You need to be obedient to the principles in God's word so, so that your stuff doesn't own who you are. The deceitfulness of wealth. We think that we own our stuff, but in a lot of cases, our stuff ends up owning us. We have to come to a point where we say, you know what, Lord, nothing that you've given me is more important than you. Nothing that you can give me will ever be more important than you. The blessing is not more important than the blesser. What I'm receiving from you is not more important than my relationship with you. And here's the deal. The problem with the parable of the prodigal son, remember the youngest one who went and ran away? He said the problem with the parable of the prodigal son is that he said, if I have my father's stuff, I don't need my father anymore. That wasn't the case, was it? He learned how quickly stuff disappear the person who has the wealth sows so the wealth doesn't have them here's the next thing Mark says he shows this he says uh, but the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things so the third one is desires for other things <laughs> Mark Mark is, uh, Jesus is incredibly vague here, I think, on purpose. The desires for other things, because I, I, it could be anything. 
It, it could be anything. I think Jesus is vague on purpose. It, it, nothing, uh, nothing is ever enough. Like, well, there's just a, a desire for any, whatever you have, it's not enough. It, it, you want something else. Uh, maybe you, you always just need to be, just need to be a little bit thinner. Or you always just need to be a little more fit. Or you just wish you were just a little bit prettier. Or, or, or maybe you're single and, and you wish you were married. And maybe you're married and, uh, no, it's going great, I'm sure. You wish you were single, right? But uh, whatever it is. It's, it's not about being married or being single. It's that you want something that you don't have. You desire, or the, the King James Version says lust for other things. And you want to be taller. What? I don't see why that's funny. Generationally, I'm four inches taller than my grandfather was, so. One. <laughs> Everything else is better. Everyone else is better. And it's, it's not about what it is. It's about you wanting something that you don't have. Whatever is not yours, desire for things that you don't have begins to choke out. It becomes an obsession. And it chokes out the word of God. And you want to be someone else somewhere else, anywhere else. And everyone else and everything else is better. It's better. And here's what, here's, the enemy can't, can't take away what you have from you. The enemy can't take away what you possess or what you have. Take away, he can't take away your looks. He can't take away what's in your bank account. He can't. So, so he just, instead of, he'll make you want something different. Since he can't take it away from you, he'll make it not enough for you. And it's different for everyone. It looks different. And that's why... It's not well defined because it's, it's completely different. What, what you need or want to change in your life is different than what I may want to change in my life. And you may be, how many, you know, you ask a kid, a young kid, how old they are? What do they tell you? Four and a half, right? And four and a half, no, I'm six and a half. Right? They, they don't want you to miss. You ever ask somebody who's older how old they are? Nobody's going, I'm 81 and a half. Like, like nobody, everybody's trying to play, you know, I'm in my early 80s, I'm in my late, late 70s, they'll say, you know, like every, nobody wants to, no, everybody wants to be different, they, like when you're young, you want to, you want to, you want people to know exactly where you're at. You'll never be happy because whatever you have, you always want something else. When you're young, you want to be older, when you're older, you want to be younger always want something else. And when Jesus teaches on these, on these three things that represent the thorns that choke us out, he calls these things, he calls them thorns. And the thorns can pop up anywhere. The thorns can pop up anywhere. You can cultivate the soil, and, and, and you can plant in, in clean or clear soil. Uh, but in, but inevitably, uh, the, the things pop up. And in case you don't, and if the farmer or, or the the sower doesn't weed, then thorns can just kind of pop up anywhere, at any time. And uh, Jesus said, "You know what? I've planted good seed in the midst of sometimes in the midst of thorns, but don't let the thorns of your life choke you out." The problem isn't with the seed. The problem's not with the word of God. The seed's good. The word of God never comes back void. And the problem isn't with how you start. The problem's not in the way it starts. It starts good. The plant grows. how it finishes we see this in marriages all the time I've seen very few marriages start terrible I've seen a couple but I've seen very few marriages start terrible 
They love each other. They're super in love. They, they're, they're just hanging out all the time. They, they can't wait to get married. Everything's great. Everything's going well. They, they, they're, you know, passionate about each other. They, they just, everything the other person does is absolutely great. They can't find any flaws in the other person. Everything about it is absolutely amazing. It, marriages can start well. But you ask a couple who's, you know, 10, 15, 20 plus years in. Is there anything that bugs you about their spouse? Oh, they'll, they'll show you a list. Those things that used to be cute, now those aren't cute anymore. <laughs> and here's what I, I, I watch people as they come together to get married, they put so much energy and time and resources and, and finances into the wedding. And I'm kind of going, man, if they would just spend a percentage of that on the marriage, 10 years from now, they'll be in a lot better shape. So how do you know if you're being choked out? I just want, here's a couple questions that you can ask yourself. How do you know if you're being choked out? And here's the first one. You can ask yourself, am I caring about things beyond my control? Am I caring about things? Am I caring about things that are on my control? Am I allowing the cares of this world, the weight of this world, what's going on in the economy, the stock market, with terrorism, uh, the, the, state, uh, the state of the, the next generation, uh, or, or you know who the president is, or who the president was, or who the president's going to be, or, or the opinions of others, or, or what's going on in the world around me? Am I allowing that to choke, off, to choke out the word of God that's been spoken to me? Are you caring about the things, about things beyond your control? Or are you taking those things to Jesus and letting him handle those things? Here's the second question to ask yourself. Does your perspective of wealth line up with the word of God? And listen, let me just say it like this. I see people get caught up in this all the time because they've heard of one pastor or two pastors that make an absurd amount of money, not for me to judge, absurd, a lot of money. And so they won't go to church. And literally, the deceitfulness of wealth wealth has choked out. You know what? I'm not going to say this for you. I'm going to say it for me. What some other pastor makes is none of my business. how he spends it and what he does with it or she also none of my business when I come to the end of my life I'll be held accountable for how I spent what I was given they'll be held accountable for how they spent what they were given I'm not God's somehow going around as God's or the church's you know financial police force worried about what everybody else is making or, and you know what I know of couple of pastors that make phenomenal money. And when you go into their story and find out what they came from, how they operate their finances, the percentage rate that they give, majority of the pastors that I know that make really good money, they're doing phenomenal things with their finances. Of course they're making good money. They're being, they're because they're sowing and God is blessing them. They're giving away large percentages and that's the nature of God. You reap what you sow. They're just reaping the benefits of having sowed for many, many years of their life before they were blessed, before they got the book deal, before they had the big church, before they had any of those things. You don't know their thorns and you don't know their story. God's not intimidated by their wealth or our wealth or anybody else's wealth and he's not intimidated by their lack or our lack or anybody else's lack. Don't allow the deceitfulness of wealth to seep into your heart. Do 
Does your perspective of wealth line up with the word of God? Here's the last one, number three. Are you content with who you are, what you have, and where you're at? <laughs> the Apostle Paul was the best at this, I think. And he said, yeah, I've been in so many situations. I've been you know, beaten up and shipwrecked and blessed, and it just names this myriad of things. But I've learned to be content in all of them. I've learned to be content in all, all of these things. Do you spend too much time comparing yourself to others? Are you always waiting for something else for the next season of your life? For that next, well, well, everything will be great once I graduate. Everything will be great once I get married. Everything will be great once the kids are finished potty training. Everything will be great once the kids go off to school. Everything will be great once they go off to high school, once they go off to college, once I get this promotion, once I get this new job, once I, everything will be great then. No, it won't. If you can't learn to be content here now, you won't be content there either. Here's what you need to understand this morning as we come to the end. It's that when the thorns of life begin to choke you, choke, begin to choke you, the word of God can't get rooted in you. When the thorns of life begin to choke you, the word of God can't get rooted in you. That's what Jesus is saying. Look, I've, I've sown. I've, I've planted. I've sent good seed. And it's begun to sprout out, up in your life. Then we let the thorns, let the thorns of life begin to choke us out choke out the word of God that's meant to be planted inside of us. Here, I've come to an end. Here's, I know we're way over, guys. Some of you are here today and you're saying, why would God allow, why did God plant these, allow, place, or allow these thorns to be placed in my life? I mean, you don't understand my parents. I mean, it's lucky I'm alive, let alone alive and in church. You don't understand the situation that I grew up in. Why, why would God plant me in the midst of these thorns? Why, why would God allow me to have to deal with this stuff in my life? I don't understand. Jesus, you're saying I have to grow in the midst of this storm? In the midst of what's going on around me right now? With, with all of these thorns? With all of this stuff? You, you don't understand, Jesus. You planted me in the midst of this job? I'm supposed to be able to keep my faith in the midst of this situation? Here's what I feel like Jesus would say to you this morning. He would take you back to the cross and he would say, do you remember when I went to the cross? And he would say this, he would say, do you remember when they beat me with the cat of nine tails? And do you remember when, when they stripped me of all my clothes and then they, they gambled? They played dice for my clothes. Do you remember when they stuck the spear, the 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 spear in my side and, and do you remember what they do you remember that they, they put me up on a cross and, and they put nails in my hands and they, they put nails in my feet and, and they hung me there to die but do you remember do you remember what they put on my head a crown of thorns a crown of thorns what I believe that God wants you to know this morning is he said no you don't have to grow in the midst of the thorns because I came and I took the thorns for you 
I came and I wore that crown of thorns so you wouldn't have to be intimidated to begin to grow up in surroundings that, that seem less than ideal with, with parents that, are, that, are, that aren't very good or with the life situations or the different things. You remember where the thorns went. I took the thorns for you. So that you can have life and not just start well, you can finish well too. That the influence of the world, the thorns, they don't have to end you. Because I took them. So you can grow right where. So may you be blessed. May you be blessed with the overwhelming realization of just how good God is. And that he's made a way for you in the midst of whatever it is that life been to trying to choke you out with. In the midst of all of that, God has made a way. And may you be blessed to never find yourself distracted by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of wealth, or lust for other things. Father, I know that there are people here this morning that, that the cares of this world have choked out what you've been trying to do in their life. God, I pray that you would give them, uh, that you would help them to begin to drown those things out with the word of God, worship, and prayer, and all of that. Father, I know there are people here, I believe there are probably some people here this morning that, that, that they've, they've allowed the word of God to, uh, to be choked out or they've become disenfranchised with the church over financial issues or, or, or whatever. God, I pray that you would speak to them about their finances. I thank you that ultimately you're our provider. God, I, I know there's probably some folks here this morning that, God, they've, they've been dealing with just the lack of being content. They keep looking to the next season of their life instead of finding their contentment in you. God, I pray that you would be with them this week as they spend time with you. And Father, we know that the enemy wants to come in and choke us out. The word of God that's been planted in our hearts. But I thank you, Father, you bore the thorns so we could live an abundant life wherever you planted us. And so, Father, I just speak that. I just speak an abundant life. I just speak an abundant, blessed life. And maybe even for some of us in the midst of our chaos, in the midst of our problems, in the midst of everything that's going wrong, in the midst of it all, an abundant life that the enemy would not be able to choke us out. Father, I speak that over our church as well. In Jesus' name, everybody said.